You're listening to True Crime Feed. Welcome to True Crime Feed. I'm your host, Angela Ferrari, reviewing the best true crime podcast from the past decade with a teensy bit of humor, plus my top three true crime picks of the week. Up first on the docket, hmm, how do I put this? Well, we're going to a strip club, everyone. The notorious upscale gentleman's sports topless bar in New York City called Scores. This place was a magnet for nefarious activities. Since its opening in 1991, Scores associates have been privy to some epic criminal scandals. So much so that we're going to have to uncover the top half in one episode, then expose the bottom half next week. And if you want to take your listening experience of this story to the next level, go to the truecrimefeed.com and sign up for my newsletter where I curate visual aids to accompany the show. It's not a full-on peep show. A lot of these shenanigans happened pre-smartphones, but I do still have some gems for you. Photos of connected mafia figures and celebrity sightings at scores in the 90s. All right, so how did we find our way into this seedy little joint anyway? I first heard about it listening to a seedy little podcast. It's time I come clean and admit my guilty pleasure for True Crime Daily. Listen, I know, this show is not good. Host Ana Garcia definitely can give off some main character energy, especially in her most recent episodes. The commentary can be a little tone deaf and sort of tabloidy. There's definitely been in quite a few episodes where I've tuned in and felt like I needed to take a shower after listening. That being said, though, True Crime Daily is one of those shows. They break true crime news first before anyone else. And I found it to be a valuable resource for discovering new stories. And when I'm low on my true crime gossip and need to re-up, True Crime Daily is where I get my fix. Even if that fix is a little icky. But there we have it. It's all out there now. No more secrets between us. Back before True Crime Daily launched their podcast, when they were still just a YouTube channel, I first came across the obscene, racy story of the Scores nightclub, and I could not get enough. So I did a deep dive with the audiobook available for free for members on Audible called Scores. All about the club owner, Michael D. Bluetrick, how his business was extorted by the mob, and how he reluctantly became an FBI informant to help take down the Gambino crime family. Yeah, dude, it's juicy, and we'll get into all of it, but before we do, um, since the events in this story took place, new allegations against Michael Bluetrick became public in 2020 for crimes that allegedly took place in 1982, long before scores ever opened. Michael had been a basketball coach at the Y, and there are claims that he was sexually abusing boys as young as 11 years old. I don't have any other news about it at this time, but just keep that info in the back of your mind while tuning into the story, because it can be easy to glorify Michael for his actions dealing with scores and the mafia, especially if you read the book. Um, But I think it's important we're aware of these allegations. Now gather round and let's begin our story of scores, the little strip club that could. Future club founder Michael D. Bluetrick was a New York native. He goes to law school, starts working at a practice, and eventually becomes a senior partner at the firm Bluetrick, Falcone, and Miller, along with future New York City mayor Andrew Cuomo. And while Andrew Cuomo worked at the law firm, his father Mario Cuomo was the governor. It's pretty wild. Mario had the power to appoint judges that his son would argue cases in front of, but apparently this wasn't a conflict of interest. So because of the Cuomo name attached, the law firm was very prosperous and Michael had a lot of success. He even argued a big class action suit where a bunch of people got sick on a cruise ship for eating contaminated shrimp cocktail. Ugh, it sounded nasty. Things went from the love boat to holy ship. Anyway, that case made Michael Bluetrick a lot of money, and he started making investments. 
into sports clubs, restaurants. He even became a boxing promoter. But he ended up losing a ton of money on one restaurant venture in California and was on the brink of bankruptcy. But in 1990, he made a deal with this guy named Shalom Weiss, who wanted to buy an insurance company in Florida called National Heritage Life Insurance. But Weiss wanted to use the insurance company's own money to buy the company, which is a form of fraud. But Michael went on with a scheme along with his lawyer friend, Andrew Perlstein. Shalom Weiss ends up skimming tons of money off the insurance company. I'm talking like 450 mil. Eventually, this will be ranked as the largest insurance company failure caused by criminal acts in United States history. But more on this whole Florida fraud fiasco later. Because while all this is going on, Michael Blue Trick also keeps getting pitched the idea to open up a high-end gentleman's club in Manhattan, a.k.a. a nudie bar. These kinds of establishments existed in major cities around the U.S., but there was nothing like it in 1990 in New York City. Instead, there were these low-life, dingy, hole-in-the-wall nude bars on 42nd Street, They were smutty dives only people of ill repute would go to. So even though Michael Blutrick was a closeted homosexual at that time, he set out to open the most high-end hetero male playground New York City had ever seen. A sports club slash topless bar with beautiful female entertainers who would perform lap dances. But they hit some major roadblocks almost immediately. It's hard to picture this now, but New York City was still kind of Puritan back in the day. They had laws in the books that stated that female nipples must be shielded by an opaque covering, i.e. a pasty. And also, if your establishment was going to serve liquor, the erotic dancers must perform six feet away and be on a platform at least eight inches high. So yeah, kind of tricky to perform a lap dance under those parameters. So Michael would have to use his legal creativity to navigate those prudish regulations. He works with a makeup artist to paint the exotic dancer's nipples with an opaque latex paint that matched their exact skin tone. So under low light, you couldn't even tell their nipples were covered. As for the lap dances, he didn't have any clever workarounds for that, but Michael did know how to delay things with legal motions to avoid being shut down for at least a year, and hopefully by then he'd make his money back. So he and a group of investors purchased the former Club A on the Upper East Side, and they renovate it into a luxury gentleman's club. There were stained glass windows on the outside to avoid any peeping toms and a long entryway outfitted with fumador lockers for cigar rentals. Each locker would eventually rent for $1,000 plus a year with a lengthy wait list. The club had a main showroom, a champagne room, a bar area with tons of TVs to watch the game, another room with a half basketball court for some reason, like why? An arcade room, a restaurant area, a super private VIP presidential room, and an even more super duper exclusive private crow's nest room with a max capacity for 10 people. That was on the second floor. Apparently, city inspectors didn't even know about that room. So you can imagine the shenanigans that would later take place in the crow's nest. And with all renovations complete and nipples covered, Scores first opened its doors on October 31st, 1991. Unlike the typical seedy New York City nudie bar patrons, Scores attracted the high-class, white-collar, Wall Street trader types. Accountants, lawyers, there were even a few celebrities on night one like Regis Philbin and Jackie Mason. Kids, ask your grandparents. Scores was also hit with a summons night one. An undercover inspector claimed the women on stage were dancing topless without nipple coverings. That was their main point of contention. They didn't even mention the lap dances at all, probably figuring that the exposed nipple violation was enough to cease all of the club's obscene activities. Michael and his fellow owners at Scores were also hit with another harsh reality of doing business in Manhattan. Mafia extortion. 
Michael Blutrick had a longtime friend named Mike Sergio. But to avoid having too many Mikes in the story, I'm just going to call that guy Sergio. So Sergio made it very clear to Mike that there is no doing business on East 60th Street without paying the Gambino crime family. You know, for your own protection. Otherwise, scores could be without liquor, linens, and food deliveries, you name it. Even the cops were on the till at that time. There was no getting around it. So Mike paid his initial fee to Sergio for protection. Ah, but there were a few more strings attached. Club bouncers would be provided by the Gambino family. They would also be in charge of collecting (coughs) and keeping the door fee. And also be in charge of valet parking. Plus an additional startup fee of $1,000 per week. And that fee would rise exponentially as the club's profits grew. Oh, and Sergio Jr. would oversee and collect all profits from the coat check room. Thanks! As you can imagine, the operations at the club being run by the Gambinos were not exactly on the up and up. Any fights breaking out at scores were usually initiated or amplified by the mafia bouncers. Many patrons would get into altercations right away when they were required to pay to check their coat, whether they wanted to or not. And they had reason to be reluctant because items were frequently being stolen from checked coats and expensive furs were also known to go missing. And as for the quote, scores valet service, patrons were charged $10 for valet parking. The mafioso attendants had supposedly made a deal with a lot owner down the street to park at the lot for four bucks a car. But instead, They were keeping the entire $10 and just parking cars wherever, willy-nilly, simply discarding any accumulated parking tickets before returning the car to its customer. So it was costing many customers hundreds of dollars in overdue parking tickets to park their car at scores. The whole mafia partnership was less than ideal. But in spite of all the hurdles, business was booming at scores. The club was attracting many A-list celebrities. So let's dish you guys in a segment I'm going to call Super Salacious Celebrity Scores Gossip 90s Edition. (laughs) Radio shock jock Howard Stern started things off. He loved scores and would frequently shout out the establishment and its beautiful G-string clad dancers. Howard would also hold private parts, I mean parties, at the club, including throwing a big birthday blowout bash for his good buddy, Walker Texas Rangers, Chuck Norris. Dennis Rodman also held his birthday party at Scores. He was a frequent patron, always arriving, wearing a fur coat, no matter the season or the weather. He would also complain about being mobbed by fans and the paparazzo every time he entered the club even though he was always offered use of the private entrance anytime he wanted, but he refused. Rodman even fell in love with and eventually married a Scores dancer. For a little while, anyway. And that became a fairy tale legend for all future dancers. Madonna and Tupac were frequent guests in the VIP president's room. Sometimes their friend Pam Anderson would tag along. Director Steven Spielberg tried to sneak in all incognito by wearing a big hat as a disguise. David Hasselhoff also tried to sneak into scores undetected, but he got spooked when fans spotted him, so he hightailed it out of the club, and a paparazzi snapped a photo of him running out the door and sold that photo to newspapers around the globe. New Kids on the Blocks, Joey McIntyre was spotted vomiting in the alley behind Scores one night and needed to be loaded into a cab. Ugh, more like New Chunks on the Block. Wait, no, I've got a better one. More like Spew Kids on the Block. The strip club was also popular with sports stars like Patrick Ewing and the entire Knicks roster, despite Coach Pat Riley posting a bulletin in the locker room explicitly prohibiting his players from going to Scores. The New York Rangers hockey team also enjoyed getting high sticks from lap dances. Superstar Marc Messier was known to be very generous with the dancers, the staff, and his fans at scores, mingling with other patrons in the main room. After the Rangers won the Stanley Cup in 1994, the team went to scores, cup and toe, and they took turns drinking champagne out of the trophy chalice. After a night of debauchery, the hockey players left, 
and they accidentally left behind the Stanley Cup. Until Messier sheepishly went back in a few hours later to retrieve it. Demi Moore was studying for her role in the upcoming film Strip Tease, so she became a regular at scores studying the dancers until she felt brave enough one night to take the stage. Other scores regulars included Charlie Sheen, Oppie, Ethan Hawke, Colin Farrell, Christina Aguilera, Donald Trump, and JFK Jr. Now for the super trashy lightning round. The grossest celebrity patron was Bobby Brown. He would frequently break the no-touching rule and was finally banned after he allegedly bit one of the girls. Ugh, Bobby Brown deserves to get a lap dance from a porcupine. Russell Crowe was also accused of being aggro with the dancers. Ugh, and John Wayne Bobbitt got up on stage and showed off his reattached manhood, even though no one asked him to. There was also a fight that broke out one night between Jean-Claude Van Damme and a boxer slash former president of the Hells Angels, Chuck Zito. Mickey Rourke was there egging them both on. The muscle-bound boys were told to take it up to the crow's nest if they wanted to duke it out. So they did, and when the dust settled, Jean-Claude Van Damme was knocked out cold. And word of this club KO spread to the tabloids with the headline, Jean-Claude Van Slammed. Scores girls conducted their own informal superlatives for their regular celebrity customers. According to them, Jim Belushi was the most pleasant, Tom Arnold was the biggest jerk, Dennis Rodman was the most high off his rocker, and the most generous overall was Howard Stern. And speaking of the scores girls, contrary to movie stereotypes of strippers, these ladies were highly intelligent, educated, business-savvy women using their position as a stepping stone. In fact, many of them were better at picking stocks than the actual stockbrokers they were dancing for. Also, a majority of the scores dancers were lesbians or bisexual, even though they were great at convincing men that they were really interested in them. No, really. As scores grew, they began attracting more and more of the best dancers from around the country. Everyone was making money at scores. But then bureaucracy stepped in. It was time for owner Michael Blutrick to go to court and argue the nipple-covering case in front of a jury. He hires an expert to do spectrum light tests on his latex paint nipple coverings. Sure enough, they were more opaque than a cotton dress shirt. Then he brings some of the scores dancers to court, paints their nipples with a skinned-toned latex paint, and dims the lights. He then instructs the witness who originally claimed the female dancer's nipples weren't covered to point out which ladies were also not wearing coverings in court now. Spoiler, they were all covered, even though the witness picked out two of the ladies in the lineup. The judge was horrified at this whole thing and still found Michael and Scores guilty, stating that they weren't following the spirit of the law. It didn't matter, though, because almost immediately the laws went limp when it came to nudity in New York City. I guess there were a few legislators out there that didn't want to lose their seat or miss out on a future lap dance if they voted against scores. So now things are really, really heating up at the club. A few of the original investors cash out, and now it's just Michael Blutrick and his partner Andrew Perlstein running the show. They give scores a makeover! They take out the basketball court and the arcade, make it more of an open concept with a huge stage and a runway for pageants and events. They also raise the liquor prices and the food prices to weed out those rowdy out of town bachelor party crowds. Beer prices rose to $15 a piece and champagne went from $80 to $500 a literal pop. They also started selling tons of scores merch. A lot of it was free promotional materials from like Budweiser that they'd make a fortune off of on resale. The club was also printing their own currency, worth only 80 cents to every dollar, but it was required to pay the dancers. Oh, and it expires after 30 days. Many men would throw out any leftover scores bucks anyway, so the wife wouldn't find out about it in the laundry, and some like to keep the money for souvenirs. At this point, Scores was a cash cow, raking in $400,000 a week, again, in 1990s money. That's a lot of beanie babies! 
The mob was also taking notice of Score's prosperity. Higher-ups in the Gambino family wanted a bigger piece of the action, so there was a sit-down with Michael Blutrick. Mob control of Scores would no longer go to Sergio. Instead, it would go to Gambino captain Greg De Palma. Oh, and that transfer of power was going to cost Scores $100,000 to be paid directly to John Gotti, the acting head of the Gambino crime family. As if that wasn't all bad enough, one slow night at Scores in June of 1996, a stupid fight broke out between two Albanian mobsters over a girl. Things escalated, a brawl broke out, and as a result, a bouncer named Michael Greco, age 22, and a bartender named Jonathan Siegel, age 25, they were both shot and killed inside the club. The shooters fled and owner Michael Blutrick gets word of the slayings while he's down in Jersey promoting a boxing match. This was bad, bad news. Things got even worse five months later. Michael was asleep in his Manhattan high-rise when he got a knock on the door. It was an FBI to search his apartment. They had a hand-drawn map of the entire layout, including the location of his hidden safe. The FBI had been investigating Michael for a long time now. They knew all about the Florida life insurance fraud, and he was looking at some lengthy jail time, like up to 25 years. So the feds hit him up with a proposition. He and Andrew Perlstein could go to Florida now and face the music, or they could agree to cooperate with the federal prosecutors and go undercover as informants against the mafia in exchange for the promise of a leaner prison sentence in a minimum security prison, then enroll in witness protection. Neither one of these are great options, but Michael decides to take the deal. He agrees to secretly record meetings with mafia members in his office above the Scores Club, and he agrees to wear a wire during conversations with captains and associates of the Gambino crime family. A decision that will change the tide of organized crime in New York City forever. And we will get to Michael's harrowing experience as an undercover informant, plus more score stories in next week's episode. So stay tuned. Yo, isn't this scandalous? I mean, I seriously can't believe they haven't made a podcast series or documentary about scores yet. Someone could cash in on this story. They could even make like a Lego movie version of it. Come to think of it, maybe I should just make a series and call it The Booby Trap. Uh, I've got so many more juicy deets for next week and I can't wait. In the meantime, let me know what you think so far. You can email me directly at Angela at the truecrimefeed.com or join the True Crime Feed Facebook discussion group. Keep an open mind and be kind to fellow True Crime Feed friends. Stay tuned till after the break to hear my top three podcast power ranking of the week. Hey, True Crime Feed listeners, I have a teensy little ask of you. I need your help to grow my audience so I can keep the stories coming. So I'm asking you to take a moment and share True Crime Feed with five friends you think will enjoy the show like a fun, awesome pyramid scheme, but you still get to hang on to your money. Cool. And if you want extra gold stars, go to Apple Podcasts and write a review for True Crime Feed. I am an independent one woman show and you taking a moment to do this will help me grow and compete with the big networks out there. So thank you, thank you, thank you so much. Now back to the show. And we're back. Before we start the ranking, uh, you guys, I watched the American Nightmare documentary series on Netflix about the Denise Huskins case. Oh my God. I'm so glad we got to learn a little more about the ex-fiance, Andrea. Did anyone else do a spit take when they said she had a previous romantic connection to the FBI investigator? Again, I totally understand why they would point the finger at Aaron at the beginning, especially after Andrea's interrogation but the cops should have immediately known that something else was afoot if they looked at his phone. I just, I don't get it. I mean, I want to look at everyone's phone, even if they aren't a suspect. I'm just nosy. Anyway, those are some of my hot takes. We can dish more about it in the Facebook group. And now without further ado, let's get down to business. Here are the three shows currently trending that I think are worth a listen. 
I present to you this week's podcast power ranking. At the number three spot, we have The Raven. Here's a synopsis from the show page. On January 31st, 2000, just hours after Super Bowl 34, Baltimore Ravens star linebacker Ray Lewis and a group of friends got into an altercation outside of a club in Atlanta's affluent Buckhead neighborhood. Within seconds, two men were dead in the street. Lewis and two friends were charged with murder. A media frenzy ensued, but in the end, all three defendants walked free. Less than a year after the killings, Lewis became a Super Bowl champion. He has made millions on and off the field since 2000 and always professed his innocence. But the victim's family still believe there's more to the story. Whoa, episode two opens up with a personal heartbreaking story from host Tim Livingston and how he feels connected to this case. It's just a reminder how that pain and trauma never goes away no matter how much time passes. Another reason why Tim is the perfect host to re-examine Ray Lewis and the extent of his connection to this double murder in Atlanta on The Raven. At the number two spot, we have Murder 101. Here's a rundown from the show page. In a small Tennessee town, a local serial killer was caught by the most unlikely investigators, a group of high school students led by their teacher, Alex Campbell. Throughout the course of one school semester, the class pieced together a 30-year-old mystery and identified the killer behind at least six brutal murders. Shockingly, while the Tennessee Bureau of Investigations publicly agrees with their theory, no charges have been filed against the murderer. While some sleuthing students already have graduated, they, along with a fresh crop of current high schoolers, still want to finish the assignment once and for all. Okay, I can tell right away, this show is not going to be for everyone. It definitely has a homemade high school project feel to it. There are a few slow moments in episode one. The momentum does pick up, though, more in episode two. With all that said, though, I have a huge soft spot for this show. I am so impressed with this entire project, and I want to support the incredible work they're doing on Murder 101. And at the number one spot, we have Cover Up Body Brokers. Here's a summary from the show page. For eight years, Megan Hess ran Sunset Mesa Funeral Home in the small town of Montrose, Colorado. She promised clients discounts on normally expensive cremations, a seeming kindness in a town where many are poor. But in the back of the funeral home, Megan's elderly mother, Shirley, was actually dismembering the dead. And then Megan was selling the body parts, heads, torsos, legs, to companies that claim to do medical research. Oh my God, you guys, the Megan and Shirley drama of it all. Are you kidding me? Stealing the gold fillings out of dead people's mouths and then using those funds to take your kid on a luxury Disney vacation with the money? Wowza. You are literally committing one of the most evil Disney villain acts you could possibly do. And then you're going to the most magical place on earth. Ugh, so twisted and I can't stop listening. Next week, we get into the money-making scam side of things on Cover Up Body Brokers. Now for my miss of the week. We have True Crime Obsessed. Here's a synopsis from the show page. The true crime slash comedy podcast you need in your life. Hosts Jillian Pensavalli and Patrick Hines recap your favorite true crime documentaries with humor, sass, and heart. Ugh, this is a tough one for me. I was a long, long time dedicated listener, literally since 2017. And I was a Patreon member for years, too. I started to cool on the show a little bit this past year. I was starting to feel like they had run out of too many interesting documentaries to cover, and they were relying too much on those, like, weird oxygen crime specials. Then the whole behind-the-scenes Obsessed Network drama exploded out to the public at Obsessed Fest back in October. And if you don't know about this, you can read about it online. 
I was sad and super bummed out for everyone involved. Um, this event resulted in a major backlash against the founder, Patrick Hines. I wasn't there. I don't have the same emotions about it. But at the same time, I honestly haven't been able to bring myself to listen to the show in months. You know, knowing what I know now, that light and funny banter between the hosts, it just doesn't hit the same. The show is no longer this escapist, fun enjoyment for me anymore. So I'm choosing to consciously uncouple from True Crime Obsessed. And now if you'll excuse me, I'm going to go cry alone in the rain for a while. Find out next week if cover-up body brokers will remain in the number one spot as the show continues, or if a new pod will swoop in and take its place. Let me know what trending shows are in your top three and what show did you have to consciously uncouple from. I'll meet you back here next week to dust off another superb true crime show from the archive for your next feeding fix. That's all for today's true crime feed. Don't forget to sign up for my weekly newsletter where I post links to my top three favorite shows of the week and bring you fabulous visual aids for every episode. Be sure to follow the show on Instagram, Twitter, and Facebook to join the conversation. And if you enjoy the show, please leave a review and tell your fellow partners in crime to tune in to true crime feed. It really is a huge help and it means the world. So thank you so much for writing a along and allowing me to be your audio accomplice. Join me next week for another feeding.